It's time for Stefano to have his... Um, well, you've got the... It's not your moment in the sun, but you've got your last book. Thank you. <laughs> Dulcis in fundo, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to talk to you in Italian, really. You're in Italy, come on, I'm joking. Um, th thanks very much for having me here and for having invited me to this. I learned a lot in these two days. Uh, I have slides and no paper, so I compliment uh, <laughs> Kane. Um, and I'm going to talk about AI and uh, policy, so two of the keywords of the title of the meeting, and uh, about regulations. I'm, I have been so lucky that I spent the last, the previous five years in my life in the Italian parliament, being a computer scientist by training, and as a matter of fact, I, I fought harder to introduce the Hour of Code project in Italy, and uh, it's very, very difficult, and the reasons is, is this, is the, the lock-in in the previous situations. Okay, I will talk about three things, really, basically, one plus three things. The first one is that, in my view, the word intelligence is a very long shot, because, in my view, there is no emotion, no awareness, no creativity, no nothing of these things that make real intelligence involved. So I hate the world artificial intelligence. In any case, that was the slogan in 1956, and and uh, uh, and, and we keep with it. Uh, in my view, it is another way of making software that brings automation to areas where we couldn't have automation before, and. Uh, it's also very difficult for me to separate the computational part from the rest, so the proper AI from the big data and the Internet of Things stuff. So for me, it's all something that it's evolving uh, and it's going to significantly change the world. Of course, automation brings uh, issues about scale and impacts of these scales. And, uh, and, and this is one of the points that I'm going to cover very quickly. And the other two points is that being statistical, uh, it brings along some peculiarities that are not, let me say, algorithms as, as usual. So to, to answer a question that was made before, uh, is this intelligence? In my opinion, it, it is not intelligence. We normally used to program computers just inputting a program and data and getting an output. Now we feed to a computer some parameters and some data, we extract the model, and then when the model is fair enough, then we say, okay, we use that to feed more data and to do predictions. But it all nails down to statistical, uh, to statistical models. Uh, it, it's very, we have an experience in Excel we have with linear regression, polynomial regression, etc. It's very easy. I would not call this intelligence, but it's, it's the very beginning of it. I mean, you have, you have data points that you observe from the reality, and then you uh, extract a model, which is a function, in this case, bidimensional, but it can be with many, many dimensions, and you try to minimize the difference between the model you extract and the data observed from reality. But the model is distilled from the data, and there will always be the, the differences, variations between the data and, and the model. Uh, classification is another another way of issue. I mean, it's uh, I can easily imagine the next version of of Excel building in logistic regression or whatever, so that you can do run models uh, inside of Excel directly, and that will be a tool that we all use. Mm -hmm. uh, the segmentation that you do, the classification you do, can be complex, arbitrarily complex, uh, and thanks to neural networks, neural networks are a way to extract these statistical models, which is very powerful, very sophisticated. But is a, there, is all, there will always be a difference between reality and the model, and there will always be a difference. And so we will always have uh, mistakes, so wrong predictions made by machines running AI. Uh, the whole idea of uh, feed forward, forward propagation, and the back propagation, the way how you program, you train neural networks, uh, is just a sophisticated way of extracting this statistical model. I think that it's very correct, this, car this joke from XKCD. I don't know if you've seen it before. So this is your mobile, uh, your machine learning system. Yep, you put the data into this big pile of linear algebra, and then uh, you, uh, you read the answers on the other side. And what if the answers are wrong? Just steer the pile until they start looking right. 
So this is the, the essence of artificial intelligence. And uh, so, I mean, it's very, it's very long shot to call it intelligence in my view. Uh, something that I, I didn't hear explicitly talked in these two days is the fact that these systems make incorrect predictions. So we have two measures for this, no recall and precision. For example, if you have to assess criminals, recall. Of all the criminals among the examined persons, how many did we recognize? Of course, China is in very much interested of having a, a, a total recall, 100%. And so just get all the criminals. But that will imply that you have uh, uh, also some innocence in, uh, in, in the pool. And, and of course, from a societal point of view, they say, well, okay, who cares if five people are sent to jail? But from our, uh, from our point of view of the European values, we prefer not getting, not, not getting all the criminals, but uh, so we are more interested in precision than in recall. I want to stress that these systems aim to make few incorrect predictions, but they do some uh, incorrect predictions. The, I, I, before it was says the, perf the perfect conference assistant. This is coherent with the narrative of, uh, of AI to be more precise than humans. But this implies that the normal is the correct thing. Because given that you extrapolate data, the model from the data, the normality of the, normality of the data is the correct thing. So what happens with outliers? We have been trying to do models and examine the function, etc., all the time. And now we disregard this as a pseudoscience, the efforts by Lombroso and uh, phrenology and these kind of things. And we use that to extract models and to make predictions. And uh, it, I believe that these kind of predictions we're making, of course, they are more accurate, etc., but we would not call that intelligence. And I think that uh, we, it's a very long shot to call that intelligence, what we are doing now. Um, when I was in the parliament, I opposed uh, uh, camera surveillance. Uh, and uh, in one committee where I presented an amendment, uh, the, one of the persons from the Ministry of the Interior told me that I would have the blood of the victims of the next, uh, uh, of, of the next uh, uh, terrorist strike in Italy in my hands because I opposed. Because, but this is because we have a wrong representation of, of, the, of, of the output. We are stating the problem in an incorrect way. Uh, it was already uh, said that in, 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 in San Francisco, they banned cameras. Uh, well, but, uh, in, in the UK, uh, a pedestrian worth fine 90 pounds uh, because he refused to avoid, uh, to, he refused to submit himself to facial recognition in the street. So this, the introduction of these technologies changes the way how we behave uh, and it interferes with what we tend to consider our, our freedom. Then uh, the same cameras in, <laughs> in, in, in London, a, a recent report said that uh, it failed 96% of the, of the persons that were identified were not criminals, okay? So how, how do, does this fit in with our values and our system? San Francisco bans facial recognition technology. When you introduce a new technology in an environment, you alter the environment and the environment then might react. And I don't know what will be the reaction of people to these technologies over time when this narrative that we get from Hollywood uh, will finish. It, as, it, it, as a matter of fact, in, uh, in Arizona, there are people raging uh, uh, at self-driving cars, throwing stones, uh, cutting the wheels, and this, and this is a reaction. And, and we see reaction to technology in, in different ways. So it, it's very complicated. So being more precise than humans, being more precise than humans is, is, is false in my view, because it implies that somehow uh, what we are maximizing is the correct thing, while we are, what we are extracting is uh, the most normal. Uh, so the question comes is, is what to maximize? Uh, in my view, decision makers should be aware of the incorrect definition of problems and the negative externalities that this cause. Take, for example, surveillance. The idea that you introduce 
more cameras leads to more security. This is an incorrect statement because having more cameras means having more data, but more data does not imply having better security. It depends on the interpretation capability and the capability of using it. But in, and it causes even more insecurity and vulnerability. Um, then uh, there is somehow the idea that if the AI is more precise than humans, uh, we can get rid of politics because uh, uh, if you have all the data of the world and you feed it into a system, it will take the right decision for society. But as uh, Stefano said yesterday, I think uh, there, are, there is a difference between what St. Augustine called scienza and sapienza. So what, what's the purpose of what you are doing? Uh, I have many other things here, but uh, let me say that in the parliament, I rarely seen, have seen fact-based policies. So data-driven policy. Uh, when I was there, I've seen that the things are very, very complicated. So the idea that an artificial intelligence can help policymakers in doing the right thing, and uh, it, it's, it, in my view, it's, it's completely wrong. Uh, I would say that lawmaking uh, is not a, a Newtonian process, but rather a, quant a quantistic, a quantum process where you cannot understand what, what are the real influence and then you get to the decision just how the decision is at, at the end. And this leads me to ask myself, what, what is the objective function of democracy? The objective function of democracy is not efficiency. It's not making uh, the, well, it's making the best, but what is the best is not efficiency, is the possibility of change, of changing in my view because you can vote yourself into an authoritarian regime, but you cannot vote yourself out of an authoritarian regime. It's not enough, it's not sufficient. In the last nine minutes, the three issues. Uh, first, quantity has a quality of, of its own. This is some paradig paradigmatic shift in my view that statistic, uh, algorithms are, are bringing to the, to the scenario. So quantity is a quality of its own. A non-defective system will nevertheless make some incorrect prediction, and uh, the diffuse introduction of system can significantly improve society. So the first, quantity has a quality of its own and may have significant effects. Uh, think for example, I, I, I would have to talk a lot about this, uh, we don't have pro-competitive regulations on over the tops, and we allow them to have network effects uh, and, and lock-ins, and that generate monopolists. And uh, a monopolist who has a perfect knowledge of their customer and vertically integrates uh, the, the perfect knowledge of the customer with the provision of goods and services is a barrier to enter for competitors. How can I start a competitor against somebody that has a perfect knowledge of the customer and I don't, and know exactly what she wants in the moment and the price she's willing to pay and the features that the offer must have? I, I, will not, I will not be able to compete. Moreover, if there are no pro-competitive regulations so that you, have, you can explain network effects and lock-ins, and uh, in my view, this thanks to artificial intelligence and big data, as I said, uh, altogether, this may lead to uh, the seeds, uh, to plant the seeds uh, for the destruction of capitalism, because it somehow it uh, uh, inhibits uh, what is the, 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 the competitive pressure, the idea that you can compete and you can start something. Competition is it's at the basis of capitalism. And, uh, uh, and a perfect knowledge and a vertical integration without pro-competitive regulation, in my view, leads to uh, competition for the, the market and not inside the markets and to global dominance, so we need to, to address that. Uh, I would say quantity is a quality of its own. Uh, uh, think about, um, in, well, in the UK, uh, they introduced facial recognition and now they have 13 million faces in uh, uh, 30 million faces in the database, in the police national database. In Italy, we used to have 50,000 physical pictures of supposed criminals, and then they, they were digitized, and the system, they expanded it up to 100,000. Then by means of a simple system at grade, they expanded that to 10 million, the possibility of storing 10 million 
uh, individuals. Now in Italy, we have nine million people in this photo database of, of the police and 16 million images. Uh, as we are here, I, I, helped draft, uh, I helped making the Italian national e-identity system and uh, how, the way how I built it was through a federation of identity service provider. And do, as we are here to talk, the, the present government has filed an amendment uh, that breaks, that cancels this federation of identity service provider and concentrates all the identity. It means that they are going to grab all the information of all the activity made uh, in, with all public administration in Italy by anybody. So this, this raises an issue. Moving from the paper picture to the database, uh, this possibility of using AI, of scaling function, is an issue, is a, a problem in itself, and that will expand to authentication and actions performed by people. So in my opinion, we need to introduce some friction there. The second point, a non-defective system uh, will nevertheless make some incorrect predictions because they are built so. So, uh, suppose that we ask a system to, de to determine uh, if somebody has the right to obtain a service, like um, Frank mentioned today, and uh, the system, a perfectly functioning system, is going to make wrong prediction. And what happens to the person for whom the wrong prediction was made. If we look at the overall system, okay, 98% right, 2% wrong, okay, who cares? But for those 2%, it will be a total damage. So this, for me, in, uh, requires, in my opinion, it requires to introduce uh, um, an idea of, 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 the, of the concept of redress by design, because redress in case uh, of wrong predictions may not be enough because the appeal procedure may not exist, it may be ineffective, in the, the cost of the appeal procedure may be too high, maybe, maybe it is not accessible to all, maybe it requires too much time, and maybe it does not correct all spillovers that in the meantime happen. So if you are not allowed to take a flight because of this and you cannot go and, and you are reported on the local press because you have been in, wrongly included in this, you can have spillovers on social media, etc. that is very hard to, connect, to correct. So in my view, all systems that have an impact on the life of persons, they should have a built-in redress by design, uh, redress by design uh, system, meaning having redundancy, and so before the decision is finalized, having other, uh, uh, an, an appeal procedure, an intrinsic kind of appeal procedure or a second judgment at least. Then the third, the third point is that uh, I am critical of the idea of uh, self-driving car anytime soon, but in any case, suppose for the, for the sake of discussion, suppose that we have self-driving cars. In Italy now we have about 6,000 deaths per year because of, uh, uh, of driving. Suppose that thanks to self-driving car, we bring them down to 60. It will be a significant improvement for the society. Nevertheless, the companies, of those, the, the companies that provided this, this service, this system to so these 60 people are going to be sued by these 60 people. And, uh, uh, and you, you will have a civil and criminal liability on, on the management of these companies because of the 60 casualties. So we have an incentive of not providing uh, things that can significantly improve the society as a whole, consider the adoption, consider all the systems altogether because justice looks at the single event of a single defective product. So uh, this requires, uh, if we want to change this and we want to have the benefits understanding that we are going to have wrong predictions and casualties, we need to uh, touch the machinery directive in Europe uh, because the machinery directive is what tells if something is defective and the liability directive which tells what happens when you are liable. Uh, you were asking uh, of a general way and a possible other system. Well, pharmaceutical industry in some kinds has a similar impact because if you take the if you, read, if you read the medicine, the paper and the medicine, you have 
you have all specification on how you should use it and what can happen, etc. And it's your own risk. And then if you die, well, it's a pity. But we have all tried that before. It took, we tested it for five years before introduction. We made a, an extremely thorough assessment if that thing improves society and not causes damages, etc. And after that, we say, okay, you can go on. And that clears any possible responsibility from the uh, CEO of the pharmaceutical company. So in my view, uh, this would be an idea of how possibly uh, regulate AI generally uh, so that we can reap the benefits uh, having and, and even if that implies that some products cannot be cannot enter the market as soon as they are made but they need they require a three-year testing phase uh, on, on, under control conditions okay uh, I have a last comment about uh, taxation but perhaps we are going to discuss when when we talk about the paper Okay, thank you very much. Comment? We will welcome. Thank you.